Tolkien's eventual sort of leg up in the world is this, is this building here. It's the King Edward School in Birmingham. One of the best. It is the best what, what, what in the American context we call a private school. In the British context, it's called a public school, uh, strangely enough. But in our case, we'd call it a private school. This is one of the best private, it is the best private school in Birmingham. It is really up there in terms of the sort of national rank, but they didn't quite rank them the way we might today. It is at this school where he gets his, his most profound education. It is, by all accounts, a wonderfully amazing experience. Uh, when we get to Lewis's biography, you'll see that Lewis actually did not, in many ways, you're surprised he made it through his education in one piece. In some ways, he didn't. He, he carried lots of scars from his youth, uh, Lewis did. Tolkien is the other way around. Tolkien has kind of the perfect educational experience, Des even despite all the struggles he goes through with his mother's uh, ostrac being, being ostracized from the family and her eventual death. But the King Ed Edward School was one of the most amazing schools, particularly in the study of languages and culture and literature. The backbone of the education was Greek, Latin, and French. But they had teachers there who were proficient in Anglo-Saxon or Gothic, more on that in a second, uh, and all kinds of other languages. And they instilled in all of their students this desire to, to simply engage with languages and other cultures as a vehicle for understanding them. And this is one of those cases with Tolkien, though, where he is just simply wired the way that he is, that he eventually became a linguist. Uh, I say here he is precocious. He actually comments that the first uh, grammatical, philological comment that he ever noticed in his life was at a very young age. He's talking to his mother, and he talks about a green great dragon. And his mother stopped him on the spot and said, son, you can't say a green great dragon. You have to say a great green dragon. And later in life, he comments, he says, I have no idea why that's the case. He says, but it's simply, there is an instinct in the English language where you want to put the color modifier next to the thing that it modifies, green and dragon. You don't want to put green out somewhere else because then it sounds like green is the great thing or the, it makes, it just, there's an instinct in the language. And he couldn't understand it just as a young boy, but his mind quickly kind of went there to say, why? Why does language function that way? And he, he actually says later in life, he goes, you can say the, the green gray dragon. There's nothing, there's no reason why you couldn't. But, but what, what, he, what he was fascinated by is the way language conveys instinct and meaning that is beyond just the cognitive thought process. That the way we, we speak, even the way I'm speaking now, if if I were to drop suddenly into a different sort of grammatical structure, these kinds of things, if I were to speak differently suddenly, that, that you may not actually pick up on it, but there might be sort of be this sort of interesting cultural reaction. Lewis loved these kinds of sort of riffs on the way language works. Those of you who have had to slog through Greek and Hebrew have experienced some of that, that pain and toil of how could people think this way? Why, what, did they know that it was easy to write left or right? Why did they write right to left? I have no idea. Why didn't they put the vowels in it until later? All these kinds of questions. <laughs> and, and actually, for, for my money, Greek's harder because it's more nuanced and it's, more, it's got more of a poetic element to it that you can shade meaning a lot more, all, all these things. But for Lewis, his mind just went this way and he was precocious. He got a big scholarship, uh, etc. And actually, at a very young age, he actually begins to invent languages. The two that we know of, now we don't have any evidence of what this was, what the grammatical structure was, but he invented two at a very young age, before the age of 10. One was called animalic. We can only think that this is a language that he probably in his young childish mind thought is the language that the animals might speak. And then he actually came up with one a little bit later called nevbosh. Again, we have, no, we have no idea what these languages function like, but the fact that a kid of such a young age is gravitating towards language, gravitating towards the way language works, and actually inventing languages tells us a bit about his natural instincts. He was, the, he was doing the kind of stuff he does in Lord of the Rings from a very young age. Now, he's a nerd. Um, we, you know, he, probably got, he probably would have gotten bullied in the modern American school system. He starts speaking Nev Bosch on the playground, you're, you know, you're going to get a swirly. Uh, it just happens. Um, but, in the, but in the context of uh, the King Edward School, this kind of, uh, at least in general, the, the, the fascination with languages is very much the thing that was uh, encouraged. He had a teacher named Brewerton, Mr. Brewerton, who was phenomenal at language, 
particularly at the training of boys, uh, this is an all boys school, training of the boys in Greek, Latin, French, and German. And the way they taught it was not, see this, is, this actually is a bit of a pet peeve of mine. We, we usually try to train our kids in languages today, why? Simply, I think, for the pragmatism of then you'll get a good job because you can speak that other language. Because you know how many languages require like bilingual people in America, so many. Now, in other parts of the world, bilingual is just, a, I, I remember the first time I was in the, the Netherlands, and I went to a restaurant, and the waitress, who was sort of bringing us breakfast, spoke in four different languages as she went from table to table. And I just sat there and I thought, you jerk, you know, first. Um, but, but the next thing was, that just the, the, that in a, that, con I mean, I was thought in, her, in our context, in, in the Americas, um, very much that would be a, a, a phenomenal skill set that could lead to all kinds of different uh, doors opening in, in their life. Here she's just a waitress who happens to speak four languages because it's very common to have all these uh, countries sort of moving in, etc. Um, but in Tolkien's world, uh, very much similarly, languages were not, though, in this case, taught simply for the sake of a leg up in the world, if that makes sense. Rather, it was considered a path to wisdom. Languages were a path to wisdom. Not because figuring out how another language works makes you smarter in and of itself, though it might. It might give you some, a new perspective on things. But rather because, uh, as, we say, as I say here, the bones of a language are always sort of sticking out. You always see the, the structure the behind it if it's taught the right way. So, unfortunately, this is sometimes how Latin is taught maybe in high school. You learn Latin just so that you do a better job on the SATs. Uh, this idea that Latin, if you understand Latin, you understand how your language has developed out of Latin, potentially. Um, or if you learn French, you learn how the French effect on English uh, has come to, come to bear, etc. Excuse me. Well, in this day and age, it, it is not that way. When Tolkien has taught these languages, he's taught it in a way that says, this is the heritage of Europe, and this is how the centuries have unfolded to the, your present day. And the way they use the language, the, the study of linguistics, was not for its own purposes, but for the purpose of better appreciating things like Chaucer, Beowulf, all of these ancient texts that had sort of precursors all the way down until the day. So under, you know, those of you who have had to slog it through Shakespeare with very little understanding of 16th century Tudor England can, can understand. Like Sometimes Shakespeare me makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and, and sometimes we think it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense. Let me give you just one example. Romeo and Juliet. What does Juliet say to Romeo when he comes to the window? Wherefore art thou, Romeo? How is that scene depicted in every single movie and every single play? She's got her, she's sort of looking out into the garden with her hand up, trying to figure out, where are you? The idea being, wherefore art thou, is we take as, because we don't know the patterns, we don't know the, 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 we don't know the politics, we don't know why he shouldn't be there. All these things are not necessarily natural in our minds. Uh, but the phrase, wherefore out th art thou, means he's standing right in front of her, and she's like, what are you doing here? That's actually the phrase she's saying in, in a Shakespearean sort of tone. But the way that language works is lost to some of us because we don't live in that world. The way Tolkien was taught languages, though, was to make him a better reader of literature. It was to give him tools for wisdom. Do you have a question, Jake? You, yeah, this Planet Narnia stuff really uh, hit with me with Shakespeare as well because this by Jove thing. The by Jove, yeah. Common, and I think as a modern reader, I always just said, oh, that must be Jehovah, that must be... Technically it is. Right, but, but yeah. it's conflated in a way that his audience understood probably a little bit more Certainly. than we did. There's more of a shorthand there, yeah. Yeah, same thing. You see by Jove in Shakespeare, you think, that's just Jehovah. Actually, no, it's Jupiter, but they, it's been the words, not, not the concepts, but the words have been mashed together so that Jove that eventually does become Jehovah, etc., which is, of course, not how we were supposed to pronounce Yahweh, but um, that's, <laughs> that's a Hebrew point. Um, but you see, the language works this way. So the way Tolkien is taught language is, is, is in an effort to make him a better reader of all kinds of books. It's not to make him um, proficient on any necessary singular test. Um, and as a result of that, he eventually comes to the study of Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon is 
uh, uh, something I mentioned in the previous lecture on The Hobbit. Uh, Anglo-Saxon is the, the phrase, or is the language rather, that we refer to when we refer to something as being from Old English. Old English doesn't actually have much English in it in the sense of if you were to pick up an Old English text, you wouldn't be able to read it. Uh, it would actually be more like picking up a German te text and trying to read it because it, it, it actually functions more like German language. It's also a language that we refer to as being Gothic, the Gothic text of this, that, or the other. Tolkien gets to this language because what he is told by his teachers is that the study of Anglo-Saxon makes him a better Englishman because the English language comes from Anglo-Saxon, and, and that's what he studies. So that's kind of the context of the education, and he loved every second of it. He thought it was phenomenal. He had teachers that, that gave him the why of the information, not just the what of the information. They told him why it was important. They, they made him a, a, a cultivator and a seeker after new learning and new languages and these kinds of things. And in this context of the Ed, King Edward School, Tolkien also established uh, what can only be described as the proto-group of the Inklings. Now, the Inklings, of course, are the Oxford group uh, of Lewis, Tolkien, and a number of others that would meet, discuss literature, uh, very often over either tea or if it was towards the evening, though not always, uh, over a beer, um, uh, was, um, that's the Inklings. The Inklings, though, were Tolkien's, really kind of his brainchild, because he grew up with these types of groups. Tolkien in the King Edward School actually had a, what I, again, I refer to as a prototype of the Inklings. It was a group that they called the TCBS. Uh, and it was a group of these students who liked language, liked literature, uh, liked to get together and discuss all kinds of things and read all kinds of texts. It has a sort of a dead poet society feel to it, uh, this group. Um, but the TCBS, um, were, uh, that was their name for the Tea Club Bavarian Society. Bavaria being, of course, the, the Gothic sort of regions of Europe. And these about four or five guys would come together in the library in off hours. They'd read literature. They would talk about books. They would work on um, sort of their extracurricular engagements with Anglo-Saxon and other kinds of things. It was a geek's heaven, very, very much. It was very much, for, for, for people who are being instilled with this kind of learning, it is very much the kind of thing they needed. They had, the, they had, they had each other's support and each other's sort of backing for these things. All throughout his life, then, he basically spends, uh, up until about the age of 18, he is at the King's Edward School. Again, it is, it is the most formative place for him. And so in Tolkien, you see both this precocious, sort of really talented child meeting up with really the ideal circumstances, uh, to the point that Tolkien essentially becomes one of the most renowned philologists of his generation, uh, at least when he makes it to Oxford. Um, you can contrast his, uh, Tolkien's success, for example, where basically as soon as he is finished, he gets a professorship at uh, one university, and then he eventually gets, very, at a very young age, a chair, uh, an endowed chair, it's called, uh, at the University of Oxford. Like, he, he is extraordinarily well regarded. He is one of the top of his field. Contrast that with Lewis, who is the popularizer, the, the writer of, of uh, uh, apologetics works and these kinds of things. He was always uh, underappreciated all of his life. He was basically just a tutor uh, until Cambridge eventually hires him away to be a chair. But Tolkien had the perfect mixture of his own natural talent and a, and a context that allowed that to flourish. Uh, and it very much comes out. The last real great moment of his life before the First World War, though, was in 1911. Uh, he took a trip to Switzerland uh, with, and of course, by this point, his mother has passed. Uh, and he goes with, uh, off the top of my head, I believe it was with an aunt. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, fully. But uh, he goes to Switzerland. And it is in Switzerland that he has some of the earliest sort of brain sort of synapse fires of some of the things that will eventually come to, to come uh, roaring in under The Hobbit uh, and in Lord of the Rings. Um, one, just simply the sheer landscape uh, mind blow of seeing all the Swiss mountains. Uh, if you've ever been there and seen it, it is you know, just absolutely phenomenal. You go from a relatively flat world to, holy moly, those are some amazing mountains. And that is exactly what Tolkien experienced as well. He had this sudden, again, here's a guy who has studied kind of the Gothic Germanic background, and suddenly he's in Switzerland. Suddenly he's in this world and he's seeing these mountains. Uh, one of the famous things is that happens as he's on the hike, um, uh, the mountain above them started having rock slides and boulder, boulders come crashing down. Um, and um, of course they're all a bit freaked out. Uh, and into his head, again, kind of a nerdy way, um, he starts to believe that there are giants up above having rock fights uh, 
uh, and throwing boulders at each other the whole time. And lo and behold, when he writes, of course, The Hobbit, he puts all that in there. But Switzerland was one of the last great times in his life uh, before much, much later after he is married uh, and he returns to Oxford. Because uh, in 1911, he starts his um, schooling, his college, you might say, in, in, our, in our vernacular. He goes to the university uh, to study at, the, at Exeter College in Oxford. Uh, and he wins a scholarship. Again, he's very precocious. He goes to Oxford. And during this period of time, he eventually marries uh, the woman that would be his wife. Uh, he dies, I think, before she does. But he's his only wife. He never remarries. Um, uh, but nonetheless, he marries Edith. Still, within a number of years uh, of being at Oxford, he is called to the war front. And it, it, there is in Tolkien this uh, sort of profound sadness. It does come through with some of his writings. Um, I can't tell you my, I can tell you my first experience of reading Lord of the Rings at the very end. Um, you expect a great big wrapped up bow of a story with everyone sort of going off into the sunset. And it's just not that. Um, uh, now, part of that is Tolkien's literary instincts. He, do, he actually says liter, literature should not end on a high note. It should end with this, always this sense of sadness that the end has not yet come. He says if you make your stories have the end come, then you're lying to your people because the end only comes when Christ comes. But what he always ends up saying is that there's this sort of, there's this profound sort of sadness sort of wrapped within him. This, I, I do think, comes from his uh, experience of the war as well. Um, the trench warfare, all of the fighting, uh, he was in some of the, the thickest battles in, in World War I. Um, there are all kinds of gruesome accounts of, uh, in troops, uh, the groups that he was with, basically go out, get mowed down by machine guns, and a, 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 a tiny fraction come back, and they're sitting in camp knowing that they're going like third round. And so the, 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 the complete um, panic, but you can't go anywhere because you're, you're there part of the army, but knowing that you're about to go charge these machine gun lines uh, just is just emotionally wrecked all kinds of people. But also the fact is, is that by 1918 he says, all but one of my closest friends were dead. Uh, the TCBS group, um, uh, one of the big Tolkien scholars actually found, uh, he, he personally owns a copy of the we might call the yearbook of uh, King Edward's school from this time. And it lists all those who died in the war, including some of Tolkien's friends. It is a staggeringly high number of the boys that had graduated from the school just simply never came back from the war. Um, Tolkien does come back, um, uh, but the, the, the fact of the matter is, is his experience in war was extraordinarily brutal. Now he will deny to the day he dies that the war somehow forced itself upon him uh, and made him kind of uh, write all these stories about Lord of the Rings. Uh, and I do think that is true. I don't think he's writing it as sort of an allegory of World War I. But you cannot read some of the really intense battle scenes. And some, I mean, some of the, the he, he is writing some of these battles as a man who's been in those battles. He, he, there has always been this sense of um, very clear, the depth of the human tragedy of how we slaughter each other on the battlefield. Um, that he becomes sort of an indirect critic of it by showing the ways that it can just sort of dehumanize and everyone just becomes a mound of flesh that you're seeking to kill. Uh, again, we'll get more into that later when we look at some of the major themes. But by 1918, most of his friends had died. Brutal war, what gets Tolkien out of it though is he, get, he's, he contracts trench fever. And trench fever is a... Uh, 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 kind of a dreadful thing. It doesn't quite go away. It's viral. Uh, it, it can flare up, go back down, flare up, go back down, this kind of a thing. It was uh, contracted through flea bites, uh, you know, to go back to this picture. Uh, all, all these sort of muddy, mucky kind of trenches that they would stand in, uh, these fleas would come in and they would contract the fever. Uh, and what ends up happening is Tolkien ends up contracting the trans, uh, contracting trans fever and he has to come back to England. Uh, and he, they, they had hoped that he would recover and then he would be sent back to the war front but he never quite does. It keeps flaring up and going back down. And, by, and then by the time he is better, uh, he is, uh, the war is over. All of that backstory to say that out of this comes all of his fiction. While he is back in England, recovering from Trent's fever, uh, 
he finally begins, we know, uh, in 1517 to 1518, to write down early fragments of stories that will come to be either The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings or some of the other Book of Lost Tales, etc. Yeah, what did I say? I'm a Reformation scholar, so 15 something always comes out. 1917 and 1918. <laughs> yeah, Luther wrote this, and then Calvin came up and said, How about some hobbits? No. Um, uh, 1917 and 1918. Um, uh, and this is when he starts to write them. This is a drawing of, that Tolkien actually gave uh, of uh, uh, this is the Lonely Mountain way out uh, uh, in The Hobbit. He was, he was a, bit of good, he's a pretty good drawer, at least in general. Um, but he starts to write these stories, beginning in 19, 1917 and 1918. Now, all of the stories he writes at this point eventually don't themselves make it fully into The Lord of the Rings or into The Hobbit. They form the backbone of three books that you can still go and uh, at least find inklings of, Book of Lost Tales, The Fall of Gondolin, uh, and Bereth, and Luthien. Um, uh, Luthien, rather, sorry, Luthien. Uh, all of these core stories start to sort of flow out of them. Um, most of these stories uh, capture two main themes. One is hope and love in the midst of a world that doesn't deserve it. The second is the fall of arrogant men and arrogant kingdoms. You're going to find both of those woven throughout all of Tolkien's fiction, I think. But right at the end of the war, again, both of these themes I find, very, they always are, are very, very striking. This, this hope and love, this ability to sort of, at, at, against all the odds, uh, love in all of its varieties, whether it's uh, erotic love, uh, husband and wife, whether it's brotherly love, uh, all the different types of self-sacrificial love, always love in the midst of, a, always love in the world that doesn't deserve it. And then on the other hand, Arrogant men, arrogant kingdoms, sort of collapsing, not because they're attacked per se, but usually collapsing by their own devices, collapsing by their own stupidity, almost, that they, that they bring it on themselves, uh, usually with a touch of irony, but very often it's, it's these arrogant men trying to dominate, trying to control, almost a Tower of Babel sense of, of I'm going to dominate this world and I'm going to become like God and then just by that, their own sheer sort of foolishness, it sort of collapses on top of them uh, in its own way. All three of these books bring, uh, in the stories and then bring all this out. Arrogant men, arrogant kingdoms, and yet in the midst of all that chaos, love against all the odds. Um, uh, the story of Bereth and Luthien um, literally was, while Tolkien has come back from the war, his friends are dying, uh, he was, again, married to, to Edith, his wife, uh, one time they were out convalescing, they were out um, uh, in a pasture just sort of enjoying the day. Uh, and the story goes, she's quite the dancer. Um, she uh, had some slight training in it, but she loved it. She just began to dance, just sort of having a fun time out there. Um, uh, I don't know what kind of dance, um, but she was just dancing um, out there, just enjoying it by herself. I can't imagine, just, I like, I'm happy right now. No music, just dancing, but that's what she did. Um, and Tolkien is sort of mesmerized by this that here he is sort of stricken with trench fever, death and dismemberment is happening uh, down on the continent, and here someone can just dance. And he starts to write a poem about it in which he sort of paints uh, the, the story of his wife as an Elvis queen, and this sort of love story of, uh, of, of Bereth and Luthien. Uh, to this day, actually, if you go to, the Tol to Tolkien's uh, grave gravestone next to his wife, it actually says Bereth and Luthien, uh, that that was the name, that they're the sort of nicknames that they gave each other. Uh, and that is what sort of boils out of Tolkien, is this idea that in a world that didn't deserve some, someone freely dancing and enjoying the day while he was there, you know, suffering the ravages of a war, that, that somehow the grace of God, he would say, uh, to theologize it, always shines through in those sort of dark moments. Uh, and uh, th that, that is one of the great stories. Fall of Gondolin, as it sounds, is one of these uh, examples of the fall of arrogant men and arrogant kingdoms, etc. But this is how he works. He just gets these shots of these sort of inspirational moments, and then he just sort of uh, rolls with it. Yeah. You said his wife. Does this mean that the original poem was written about Edith's wife? Essentially, yeah. It's essentially um, an interpretation of the moment, you might say.
Yeah. That gets used to create a longer story that gets into the Silmarillion, which then becomes a backdrop for Lord of the Rings. Yes. Yeah. Um, as as one uh, one pastoral uh, application once put it to me, um, th there's a part of the River Mississippi that you can actually step over it with one jump. If you go for, if you follow the Mississippi River, River all the way up to the north, uh, at one point it's just a little rivulet. It's just a tiny little thing, and obviously eventually it becomes the Mississippi River. Um, that, that's kind of the analogy I'm using. Is like at this point, in this one moment, love for his wife, and, and just his instincts literarily, he he begins to write this poem out. Uh, and that's that sort of little tributary that eventually, as he starts to develop and flesh out stories in this whole kind of crazy world, um, that's, that's one of the, the central planks of, of what he's doing. That's right. Um, as he comes back and after the war is over and he heals up from Trent's fever, his first job is he uh, actually gets uh, employed by the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, most of you might have either seen or maybe you own an Oxford English Dictionary. It's usually, about, it's, it's usually a monster. It's usually the thing you use as a doorstop now that you actually have the internet. Um, but still, the Oxford English Dictionary, if you get a full set, it could, I mean, it will sort of span one of these tables. It's, it's, it, it is a, it is a, I think it's actually still being worked on. Uh, it's completed in essence, but they still are going back uh, and, and sort of correcting and updating it. But the Oxford English Dictionary was an attempt to take every word, every known word, and trace its origins back historically. So to try to figure out its sort of root and what, what kind of backdrop it had, whether it was Germanic or French, uh, maybe Latin, these kinds of things. And this is Tolkien's job, is he gets the job at the Oxford English Dictionary, and he's phenomenal at it. To this day, if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary and you look up the Germanic roots of the words that begin in W, a lot of them are actually written by Tolkien. Um, and again, if you get a full set, uh, I believe even the website for the Oxford English Dictionary will sometimes have the attributed of author, and you can go find Tolkien's comments. Um, it's, it's, it's great read. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but he's there. He, and, that, and that's his world, though. You, how do words uh, express the cultural heritage of where we come from? Um, and it doesn't take much. I mean, we could, I could spend a lot of time doing this with English words. Um, uh, I'm not going to. But, I could, but we could go through these kinds of things that the way we use our words, the way we use our slang, uh, the, the, the etymology of these things always is more than just the word itself. It's usually a cultural history of, of the people. And that's what the Oxford English Dictionary set out to be. Uh, he got the job. He did very, very well at it. But by 1920, he was given uh, his first uh, what they call lectureship. He wasn't, now, in the British world, you're not a professor unless you're at sort of the top of the, the dog pile. Uh, what, you, what you typically are is a lecturer, um, if you're sort of uh, at a, my rank, that's sort of a lecturer, professor type. In America, everyone's a professor, and they just have different prefixes, assistant, associate, et cetera. But in the British system, even back in this day, he was a lecturer. He, he had, a, he had a, a job to lecture on certain topics at the University of Leeds, mostly in the English faculty. Very, very quickly, though, 1925, he is given the chair of Anglo-Saxon literature at Oxford. Uh, and in this day and age, a chair is, is still, it still means the same in an English or American context as it did in an English context. A chair is a really big deal. Um, to be given a chair at his young age is just a, is just a symbol of, of how much he was looked upon as a towering figure in his field of, of English literature studies. Um, now, it's hard to reckon with the, square with the fact, I should say, that he doesn't actually have lots of books on literature. If he wasn't publishing sort of scads of articles on literary criticism, uh, he doesn't have lengthy, you know, treatises on things. I mean, really, if it wasn't for Lord of the Rings, most of you would have thought of him as some obscure Oxford scholar that was lost to oblivion. Uh, but, but in his day, he was considered a towering figure, a, a very, very precocious intellect. Uh, and he moves to Oxford with his wife. By this point, they uh, have uh, at least one child. I think the second is on the way. Uh, and this is the house uh, there in Oxford. It's in this house, it, there's a little blue plaque that you might be able to see way up there. Uh, there's a little blue plaque, ugly blue plaque, but you can go see it and it says this is the, the home where Tolkien lived. Uh, it's in this house that he wrote The Hobbit, he wrote uh, most of the, uh, the, finished The Silmarillion, and he wrote the first two books as we, we know them of Lord of the Rings uh, before he ended up moving to another place once the kids were out of the house. Um, and it was here that his, his whole life existed. You can contrast him with Lewis on this front. Tolkien spent all of his days, just about, from the age of, uh, the, of 21 uh, to the end of his life, married, home life, kids, 
as he wrote Lord of the Rings, he was stepping over toys into his study. Um, uh, you know, the, the kind of chaos that every one of us that has kids has experienced or is experiencing now, um, or will, some of you will experience at some uh, maybe near future. Uh, th this kind of world was Tolkien's world. He, he is, you know, you compare that with, with Lewis, the sort of strangely consummate bachelor who halfway marries Joy Davidman late in life so that she doesn't get kicked out of the country, and then goes, no, no, I really meant it. And then he actually does marry her. Like this kind of tortured Lewis life is not that of, of, of Tolkien. Tolkien's life is very, very much um, uh, the kind of, you know, uh, ha almost literally, house with a fence around it, a wife and two kids. Um, he has a very stable, sort of simple, straightforward life. But it's also a life where Tolkien will always say he enjoys the simple things. Meals together, comfy beds, um, uh, being with family and friends in conversation. Um, these kinds of everyday shafts of light in kind of the, 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 the chaos of life. Uh, and again, if you read Lord of the Rings, I, I, this is, I even noticed this when I was a child, he never stops, he always stops as to say, to, to talk about the food they're eating. There's this kind of rhythm of life in Tolkien's world that you can see kind of played out in his own life. Um, that, that he actually he actually does say at one point, he goes, um, <laughs> he says, I'm very much like a hobbit. Uh, he goes, I like my food plain, I like it relatively uncooked, and I like it simple. And he goes, but I like a lot of it, and I like to sit back and uh, talk and smoke a pipe and talk to my friends for hours on end. And he just kind of is this guy. But this is the world. This, this is the home where he lived, and this is, this is his backdrop. Again, it was in this house where he wrote, where he wrote all of his books, um, and he wrote most of them late into the night, staying up long after he should because he had no time during the day to do it. He had kids. He had responsibilities. He, uh, the, the rhythm of his life was he got up every morning, uh, uh, didn't take a shower yet, but, he, but he, often if he could, he would grab the, grab the boys. They would go down the street to the Catholic church where a mass was said in the morning, do a church service, come back, uh, and then his day would just, just go from there. Um, often what happened is students would come to his home for tutoring sessions. This is how it was done back in the day. Uh, and his wife would be, you know, you want something to eat. She'd very kind of, I mean, this was kind of the, the, the place you'd want to go hang out if you could uh, in its own manner of being. But, but Tolkien had very little time, and so he'd always just stay up late doodling, he would say, in his fiction. It's very much sort of a private world that began to sort of emerge and develop. And by all accounts, Tolkien would never have published a, a, a single shred of it had it not been for C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis comes crashing into his life. Uh, Tolkien shared none of his writings ever with anybody else. And somehow he just trusts Lewis, and he has sort of a, a common sensibility of literature, and he hands him one of, the, one of the manuscripts of the early part of The Hobbit, et cetera, and some other manuscripts. And it's actually Lewis who says, this Hobbit book is phenomenal, and he actually tells one of his students to go help get it published. Uh, Lewis is almost the midwife for all of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit series because of their friendship. Tolkien otherwise would have just simply lived on his days uh, here almost like Sam uh, with his wife and just sort of gone on into, into the next life without much of care or concern and uh, somebody might have thrown the papers away that eventually would have been Lord of the Rings, etc. But very, very much this is Tolkien's life. Very simple, very plain, very Hobbit-like. Uh, very much not wanting to go off on adventures. In fact, the day he died, he never traveled. He never learned how to drive a car, didn't want to. Uh, he would take tra trips to the beach, but he was asked to go all over the, con the country and the world to, to give talks. He's like, no, I'm fine. Like, I love my life, I love my family, I'm going to stay here right now. Uh, very much that, that kind of sort of Bilbo-esque uh, lifestyle. 